Toyota's performance hero is set to be reborn with reports of a new 300 kilowatt MR2. Yes, it's time to strap in for another edition of the Cars Guide podcast, the show that takes you beyond the test drive. This is episode 206, Toyota's Maximum Attack. Uh, I'm Cars Guide Deputy Editor James. And joining me in analysing the growing sports car push from the world's biggest car maker are managing editor, head of video, Matt. Hello. And boss of the wash, editor, Mal. G'day, fellas. Great to be here. We'll also look at the fresh metal we've been driving this week and dive into your feedback. YouTubers, if you want to plot your own adventure, you can jump ahead courtesy of the time codes in the notes below and you can click on the chapter markers in the timeline. So let's get into Toyota's ongoing personality transformation. And Chesto authored a story this week uh, with reports out of Japan pointing to a decision having been made within Toyota. There was some chat that um, maybe the, the third pillar, I think they're calling it the three brothers, that Toyota wants to go back to a time when um, they used to have MR2, Celica, Supra as their three sporty type cars. So this time around, they want to have Supra 86 and MR2. And this thing will still be mid-engine, mid-ship, runabout, two-seater, um, but with a 300 kilowatt, in fact, that, that's 400 horsepower. So it tends to put the MR2 in a slightly different um, league. What do you guys make of it? I think it needs to be in a separate league if, if the talk of a V6 and hybrid drivetrain, you know, to be believed. Because, you know, those two are heavy elements. Uh, yep. So it would need to be bigger and faster and kind of a bit more 911-esque. Yes. Uh, so we're talking a 2.8 or a 3-litre V6 uh, petrol so, yeah. with electric motor. It's, um to me, uh, is there a market for it? Like, we're, this, you know, you're looking at a Supra that's eighty dollars to $100,000, um, which I think for a lot of people, for a Toyota... Um, not a classic Toyota, a, a new Toyota that's just a BMW, really. Um, then you know, is there really a market for a hundred and sixty to two hundred thousand dollar Toyota sports coupe? Yes. Can I also point out that Toyota via Lexus already makes the LC, which is pretty much this, but with the engine in the front. Right. And and I don't think this report actually suggests you know that it suggests the MR2 is coming. We're presuming that. MR2 yep. means, you know, mid-engine because of the mid, uh, mid-rear mid element yep. of that acronym. Yep. Uh, but I'd be very surprised if it's a totally different car to the Lexus LC. Mal, uh, Mal just um, to be a pedant there, having, mm. having been around when the uh, MR2 first appeared, it is actually midship runabout two-seater specialty. Sorry, midship runabout, runabout two-seater specialty is the, um, uh, is the acronym. And how much uh, market is there for more two-seaters? Like, yeah, you know... I don't know that that, that many uh, people are indulging in a two-seat sports car as well, it is. And overnight, you know, the Mercedes, the new Mercedes SL has gone back to a two plus two for the first time in decades. Mm -hmm. Right. So that's an acknowledgement of uh, the limited uh, appeal. It's, a, it's a really good question, uh, Matt. And I suppose it also begs the question, will it be another shared model? in that the Supra had some of its shine uh, kind of dulled by the fact that it was a shared model. And as you say, a lot of people perceive it as just a BMW with a different skin over the top of it. The 86 is shared with Subaru. Mm -hmm. um, whether an MR2 could be, would be shared with anybody who wants to sign on to build, co-build um, a midship sports car. Well, like Mal says, maybe it's Lexus. Maybe Lexus has a plan right. for such a model um, beyond the current LC. Um, and, you know, they have played with um, pretty sporty models in the past in terms of LFA. Uh, and maybe this could be the next iteration uh, of an LFA, uh, potentially. That's, that's Mal, where Mal, my mind went to. Mel, time to breathe out. You want to say something? Go for it. <laughs> <laughs> I just sort of thought the Lexus LC's engine is well behind the front axle, which technically is mid -shift. Mid engine, mid front, mid front. Mm. Yeah, that's true. So yeah, okay, maybe that's how they amortise the cost, but that's still relatively small volumes, isn't it? Um, so it's all about image, and maybe that's something that we constantly refer to. Akio, Akio Toyota. He's the he's the head of the company. He's made a decision some time ago that they're going to move away from a relatively conservative um, philosophy and strategy 
to get some sporty cars in there and add some pizzazz to the brand. Mm -hmm. And that's happened over time. We've now got things like the little GR Yaris and and Toyota being back in World Rally in such a big way. And Mm -hmm. the 86 was a breakthrough car. And, you know, like it or not, the super comeback was pretty significant Mm -hmm. for, for Toyota as a company. Yeah. Um, and now they're just seemingly wanting to continue that with a third car, a third outright sports car. Will it be Celica four wheel drive? I remember speaking to Tetsuya Tada, mm-hmm. the, the father so-called of the 86 and of the Supra. He ran both programs and saying, right, what's next? Is it Celica? Is it MR2? And he said, more or less, it could be either. But he wanted to make four wheel drive, all wheel drive Celica. Um, because he wanted to reignite some of that rally stuff in Salika's heritage. He was really keen on that, but he said it could go either way. So they seem on a determined path. Yeah, mm. I can remember when the first rumours of the 86 hit and it just it sounded like, you know, someone was suggesting they were going to bring back Elvis. You know? <laughs> and then the same applied with the Supra, mm-hmm. uh, the same applied with the GR Yaris. And guess what? We've got all three of them. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, but you and know what we don't have? have exceeded our expectations. You know what yeah. we don't have? A hot hatch version of the Corolla, which we've been waiting for for five years. And yes, it's yes. um, it's this uh, I guess doggedness in trying to appeal to uh, markets of buyers that are very very niche. Mm. That is at odds with what Toyota really has stood for for so long mm. in, you know, offering ever better cars, as they mm. like to say, to more people and to not be able to have performance uh, available to the masses, um, you know, like a, a GR Yaris, sure. It's a limited run sort of car um, and 50,000 bucks. Mm. Um you know, like for a lot of people, that's well beyond, and it's two door. You know, like it's, right. again, the, these are all limitations to the appeal of the performance so, aspect. Are, are we saying that Accio might be barking up the wrong tree, and he's he's expending a lot of resources and time and and whatever else to try and enhance the brand, but could be actually weakening it or compromising he's, it by by doing this to too to, doing this too much. He's going to leave a really strong legacy for the brand when he decides to walk away. Um, But, you know, at the expense of maybe appealing to more people with more affordable performance. I'd argue we're probably drive away doing donuts (laughs) as opposed to, as opposed to walk away. As the master test driver that he is. It sounds like he might retire to the ring. Yeah. His business card says master driver. Yep. So that's good. I mean, if yeah. you can define yourself in that way, that's awesome. <laughs> I remember you asked for that to be on your business card, James. No, mine is uh, uh, genius. Uh, oh, mine sorry. says Wiley Coyote genius. <laughs> yes, I, I have that. I have those cards, and I'll I'll hand them around at various times. Hold on, I've actually got one here. Hey, um, <laughs> you're you serious? It? Oh yeah. no, it's hiding. Hold it, you can't hold it in front of your face. It's hiding, bummer. Oh, oh there, there it is. It is. Wiley Coyote. Genius. I've got a whole box of them. Off topic, uh, Wiley Coyote is my all time favorite. And I got a teddy bear of Wiley Coyote when I was seven. Are you kidding? Wow. Wiley Coyote is your favorite. All All time. Always been Foghorn Leghorn. (laughs) And the way he just hammers that dog. I loved him. him. He's just a lovable fool. I love Anyway, (laughs) there you go. What about you, Mel? I'm still waiting for my soft toy. what's, What's your favorite Looney Tunes, though? Uh, don't be predictable and say Bugs Bunny. No, I don't know, actually. I've never... Elma. I tend not to have favourites, Janice. Okay. Oh, God. Oh. Get off the fence. Anyway. <laughs> um, anyway. All right. So... I'll get off the fence and go straight back to GR and GR Sport. Yeah. Yes. And I reckon Toyota's answer to Matt's concern about mass market appeal would be that they have the GR Sport tier, which yeah. we're already seeing in, you know, CHR, uh, 300 series Land Cruiser, and... Yeah. You know, about to be on the the uh, the Hilux, and no doubt lots of others as well, which are less about outright performance, more about sort of uh, sporting personality, yeah, and, and a bit of extra uh, capability. Yes, I mean the other elephant, the the hybrid hypercar elephant in the room, um, is the GR Supersport, um, with Le Mans and top tier sports car racing changing its regulations to welcome a, a hypercar category. Um, and initially there was a, now I'm, I may stand to be corrected on this, but I think there was a homologation regulation that said you had to produce 20 of them 
um, over a three-year period. Um, right. And that has since been ditched, okay. um, as I understand it. Toyota still wants to make the car as a, as a race car, but there's a question mark as to whether or not they'll still make it as a road car now that they don't have to. Mm. Um, but that, talk about a statement. I mean, it's, it's, it would be amazing if they made it as a road car. And, but again, why? Yeah. yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. I just keep coming back to, is Toyota, like, yes, Toyota is a brand that has cachet, but it's got a different type of cachet. It's got reliability. That's the strongest point that is known when people say Toyota. Uh, they don't, I don't think, you know, uh, the majority of people, the average car customer thinks I need the sportiest Toyota I can get. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, that little little emblem on the uh, badge doesn't necessarily scream, this is super, super but, but desirable. I, th- I think, as we've said before, people buy brands. And, and if, in, in marketing terms, if as a trusted brand, you've got that, and then you can add some sense of innovation or excitement to it, that's magical. You know, that's where a brand really takes off. And I'm sure that's the psychology behind trying to do this. And also it seems like Akio Toyota is half a petrol head and just wants to, you know, go racing and be a master driver and do all that. Yes, Mel. Uh, can I also point out that they've just won Le Mans for the first, for the fourth time on the trot. Sure. So sure. Well, sure. I think they've, Halo I think, is, is going pretty brightly. Well, and, they've had the competition, a uh, competition of Glickenhaus really, haven't they? I mean, there are no Porsches in there. There's no one else. Mm. Uh, it seems like it's shooting fish in a barrel. Yeah, but um, they can still but, say they're a four-time Le Mans winner. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, what does that mean? Like, I, I've well, always wondered what what does that mean? Like in twenty twenty one, good question. You've got um, still got Commodores and stuff running around in the race in V eight supercars. That is not V eight supercars anymore. The other ones are Mustang. Yeah, yeah. you know the Commodore oh, victories. I would never have known. Uh, Commodore, Vic, <laughs> Commodore victories at Le Mans are all but forgotten. I mean, it didn't make any yeah. difference. Oh, it went all right at Spa in 87, I think. <laughs> hey, that's a great point, Mel. That's a great point. But this is um, like, what is it? Win on Sunday, sell on Monday. That yeah. whole idea is just so dead. Uh, right. And the, to me, it just makes no sense. And I've always questioned the idea of putting so much budget from a car company perspective into motorsport as a, yes. a focal point. Um, yes, it just doesn't make that much sense to me. Like they could be spending that money to make more appealing, more affordable options. And like you say, Mel, yeah. the GR Sport line, um, I think we've, I think Toyota's done a really good job of making GR this special brand that means more than it does. Yeah. And GR Sport is like, it's a Hyundai N line equivalent or a kia gt line equivalent yep. it's just a sportier version a sportier looking version later yeah. yeah and all what, is, what we ha- what we haven't seen yet is grmn yes so yes. you know you've got you've got gr light in terms of gr line then you've got gr okay full, full strength and then your your elephant beer equivalent is grmn mm-hmm. um and we just haven't seen that yet that'll be interesting mm. yes uh, the, the other one i wanted to mention almost one that got away I don't know whether you guys recall it. In 2014, there was a little concept called the SFR. Mm-hmm. So as I understand it, that was S for small and FR front rear. So front engine, <laughs> rear drive. 2015 Tokyo, I think. Six-speed manual, entry-level yeah. car. Looks really cute. And I, MX5 it, it, with the roof, basically. Yeah. It, it obviously fell by the wayside. It looked like um, an interesting prospect and close to production ready. Like it was pretty well developed as a concept. Yeah. yeah. Um, and shame. when you mention it to Tata Sun these days, he's just like... Yeah, you, you know, the, the the disappointment is clear. Oh, really? Really? Yeah. Oh, okay. I've I've brought it up every time I've seen him since. Yes, yes. <sighs> well, there was yeah. another one too, which was a bit offbeat. Way back, two thousand and four, the motor triathlon race car concept, MTRC. Do you guys recall that one at all? <laughs> but people on um, did that have on, clear panels for people on YouTube? Mm, not really. It had some weird burger panels, but um, I don't think any of them were clear. It was hydrogen powered, so it was well ahead of itself there. Four electric motors, one on each wheel, oh. and had an adaptive suspension. So the, the wheels were hanging out there like a formula type car um, and an adaptive suspension. Really wild. Like way back then, that's a that's a sign of intent as well. So this it's been bubbling around. I was going to say also, just on the, the whole thing with the three brothers, and this could be 
Toyota's fond farewell to ICE engines, uh, you know, like the internal combustion starting to fade out uh, more yep. and more hybridization, electrification, full electric is coming from Toyota. Yep. We know that yep. um, these, these three pillars of the farewell uh, could be the thing. Now it could also be that, you know, maybe the MR2, if it's an existing thing should be electric. It should be the first kick in this is this is how we do it. This is why you will pay two hundred thousand dollars for this car. Yeah, and you know maybe that's the better approach. If mm. I was uh, considering it, I, you know, I get petrol appeal. I a hundred percent get it. Having a performance hybrid, you know, that's becoming more and more mainstream. Mm. Uh, but you know, a car like that that lends itself to low, uh, long, you know good size battery pack underneath mm-hmm. um could be it's all sounding a lot like what the next lc should be as well well mm. it's weird you know i don't know about you guys but psychologically i really love a zero tailpipe emission city car i love them you know mm-hmm. um bring it on id4 id3 i've always liked the i3 from bmw yeah um just seems so right and so yep. sensible for the times I'm just a little more conflicted when it comes to electric sports cars and electric performance cars. And I know the Taycan's been a huge success for Porsche and hats off to them um, for reading the tea leaves and, and getting it in market and doing well with it. But just and the me, a- AMGs I, are coming. Yep. AMGs are coming. I, I'm just old school enough to still have a bit of reluctance when it comes to electric sports cars. But you're, you're right, Matt. Maybe that's just the way to do it is to have an old favourite with, with a new powertrain to, to get people tuned into it. Maybe. Yeah. All right. Look, I think we'll we'll leave that discussion there. Be good to hear what our listeners and viewers make of Toyota's decision to to more or less transform its personality and and become this sporty car company as well as the uh, the the reliable maker of of um, you know really good offerings in each category um, and hear what you've got to say. But before we move on, anything else you wanted to say, Mel? I just want to check in. I was just going to say if if everything turned out to be wrong and they do make an SFR. Two thumbs up. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Doors still right. open. <laughs> right. Who um who's got two thumbs and likes an SFR? This guy. <laughs> yeah. Okay. It was uh, so close to production already. Oh, uh, it was I so know, close. I, know. I remember probably seeing had, it. The dashboard, the, the shut printed. lines, the light apertures. It was yeah. so ready. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. The brochures would have been done, ready for mm. shipping out to the dealers. The whole bit. Sad. Sad. Anyway, now. Metal that we can actually drive. No SFRs in our garage uh, this week, sadly. But, Mal, talk about significant uh, Toyota metal, and, and we've just been touching on the whole GR thing. Yeah. Please fill us in on, on what you have been driving. So it's now a few weeks ago, but I'm told it's the first time we've mentioned it in the podcast. Uh, but I was lucky enough to attend the media launch for the new 300 Series Land Cruiser, which hands down, is the most anticipated model of my career to date. Uh, and I got to do kind of a bit of everything in it. And where, in, in terms of being able to sample the, the thing in uh, various conditions, where were you, Mel? Where did it take place? So we drove it to down near Goulburn. Uh, the Toyota Land Cruiser Club has a fantastic property uh, just outside of or in the Goulburn area. Yeah. Uh, where so we did a lot of highway driving to get there, did a lot of sort of uh, country driving to get off the Hume to get to the to the facility, and then we put it through its paces off road, good and proper, fantastic, uh, proper low range stuff, proper obstacles, uh, loose dirt, water crossing. Uh, I attached it to a two point nine nine ton caravan for a moment. And pulled it up a hill, and it accelerated up a hill. So, right. Uh, any yep. doubts about the the V six? Uh, it still performs with two point nine tons behind it. Uh, whether you know whether one should do that regularly is another mm. question. But um, it's a it, it, very very impressive machine with uh, not many disappointments. Did it feel? Does it feel? like an incremental step from the 200 or a quantum leap you know what what's the difference it, it's tricky because it feels like it's stuck to the brief really really carefully it, it doesn't feel as big a leap as 
uh, that uh, the difference between 100 series and 200 series was, but the 200 series was still head and shoulders above, you know, in terms of diversity of options, et cetera, above anything else on the market. Uh, so, and they, you know, they describe it as a clean sheet design and they've rethought every single thing in that car. Uh, so it doesn't feel like the giant leap, but it does feel 14 years newer than the 200 series. Cool. And the, the one that you're actually in now, um, having a drive of this week is a significant uh, one. Yeah, so I've, I've actually drove home yesterday the, the GR Sport, uh, which is the new variant, um, kind of sharing the top tier with the, the ZX Sahara, uh, which is $137,000, I think, for the GR mm. Sport. The ZX Sahara is $138,790. Yeah. So they're, they're getting up there, still with yeah, Toyota badges, yeah. very yeah, expensive yeah. cars, but uh, the queue is lengthy <laughs> for these cars, and it's not helped by the fact that Toyota's having trouble building them. Uh, yes. But the, the anticipation in the lead up to this car's reveal, specifications, launch, it yep. exceeds anything else I've seen. Do you know, um, it's interesting, just um, at a tangent here for a sec, I was reading uh, through the week about the semiconductor shortage and its knock-on effect for microchips and, and car manufacturer, et cetera. The background to it all, of course, is based in COVID and plant shutdowns. And then people went to work from home, so they needed all kinds of electronic equipment. And there was a shortage. And then it was the equivalent to people cleaning out the toilet paper aisle in the supermarket. Manufacturers of stuff just stockpiled um, semiconductors and microchips. And that's why we're suffering right now. Yeah. And then I think the, 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 the core of the 300 series production issue is the resurgence of COVID in Japan. Mm-hmm. So right. it's, it's, you know, the waves of, of impact. Yeah. Uh, anyway, it's a yeah. complex scenario and uh, they're doing their best to overcome it. All right. So you're driving the GR300 with a big smile on your face. You're enjoying it so far? Uh, yeah. I mean, I just it, it did a great job on the, uh, the, the motorways <laughs> of Sydney on the return yesterday morning. Uh, but I, I do have a scoop for everybody. Okay. Very good. Okay. Um, I didn't notice on the day because I didn't manage to crawl underneath it. But now I have the bash plate the standard bash plate underneath the front of the gr sport is carbon fiber what mm. what? <laughs> what yeah dead carbon set fiber. and we'll put a picture up here but uh dead set it's carbon fiber and so toyota the press conference you know came out with a big you know hoo-ha about the standard accessories available to to add to your 300 series and you know one of them was a, a aluminium bash plate which i think is four five millimeters thick you know big sturdy bash plate but I'm not sure about the other variants, but the GR Sport has a, a carbon very fiber. elaborate carbon fiber bash plate, the sort of thing you'd typically see under a WIC car, you know. It would have to be a very deliberately laid weave on the carbon because um, traditionally carbon's quite brittle. And I mean, in, in tension, it's very strong, but. Well, actually, I dare say it's got it, a bit of Kevlar in it. Yeah, right. Wow. But, 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 you know, it, like, they, they went to town telling us about the, the attention they paid to weight reduction, even though, you know, it's, I think it's 100 kilos lighter in average across the range. Yep. It's still a 2.5 tonne plus vehicle. Right. Uh, but, you know, carbon fiber bash plate ain't cheap, nor, nor is the car. But it's, it's a sexy little detail I didn't expect. So don't yep. get underneath the front of a, a GX to see if they all get it. <laughs> Just got it, this image it could be a GR thing. Scrambling under cars is. in typical male fashion. Well, it right, just well, proves that, it proves that I should do it, James. Very good. Mm. Yes. No. I was never doubting you, Mel. Not for <laughs> not for an instant. Uh, scramble away. And thank you, Mel. We'll we'll Pleasure. move on. Matt, you have been in a a similarly rugged uh, machine, but you haven't necessarily mm-hmm. been doing rugged stuff with it. Tell us about it, please. Yeah. If if you're watching on YouTube, you'll see. I can't. I can never figure out which shoulder it's behind. Uh-huh. It's over one of my shoulders. Uh, two thumbs back. Yeah. Oh, two thumbs back. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. That's that's, it. that's the video guy behind me there as well. Uh, <laughs> so that's um the Ford Ranger Raptor X. Now this is the fitting farewell <laughs> to what most of us have considered the best ute on the market for some time. Um, Raptor X is now $79,390, meaning, yeah, it's over 80 grand on the road uh, and you're looking close to 85. Um, So it's a lot of money, uh, especially if you choose the optional color. Uh, That one's Ford Performance Blue. Mm -hmm. Um, 
as you can see uh, from the pictures that you'll be seeing if you are on YouTube, um, a bunch of different features for this, uh, some blacked out exterior elements to give it some more X factor. And also the uh, over the top stripes, which are a bit over the top, um, which are inspired by the Mustang muscle car, but it fits under that Ford performance umbrella uh, in, in the brand's marketing. Um, you know, what can I say about it that we don't already know about the Raptor? It's amazing. It's got Fox shocks. It's got BF Goodrich tires. It's fantastic. It's got a great two liter bi-turbo engine. It's a four cylinder beast. Coil spring rear end. Coil spring rear end. And this is where the shortcoming is. Um, now in these tests, because there are two tests that I've performed with this vehicle, which you'll be seeing over the coming days and weeks, um, is uh, one was a towing test. And as we know, the towing capacity for the Raptor is 2.5 tons, where for every other Ranger, it's 3.5 tons. Uh, so you've got to be willing to make that sacrifice. And also I've done a payload test um, and the payload for this vehicle is 714 kilos, which is pretty weak for a vehicle Ooh. of this size. And with yep. this intent, um, you know, you take yourself out of that, you got, well, I'm not 114 kilos, but let's say you've got 600 <laughs> kilos to play with. Um, and, you know, that's not very much. And as we found with our test, which you'll see a couple of pictures of if you're watching on YouTube, uh, the back end sagged really, really dramatically. Yeah. So uh, with 600 kilos of sandbags and pebble bags in the back. So um, a really interesting test. Uh, looking forward to sharing the words and videos with you as we uh, produce them in the next couple of weeks. So stay tuned. Mm. Stop Fantastic. Very two. interesting. It so, makes sorry. you think with it makes you think with that pay payload. If you've got four people on board and they might average, I don't know, say it's an average of seventy kilos, maybe a bit less. That payload starts to become marginal, even if you're taking a family holiday and heading off road and you've got all the gear, like your, your metal campfire stuff, and it, it all adds up pretty rapidly. Yeah, it does. Yeah. And this is the, the thing that people need to keep in mind when they are, you know, considering a vehicle like this. Uh, also, you've got the gross combination mass, which is lower than the others. So if you are loaded up and towing, you've mm. got to really pay attention to the maths to see whether you are able to tow as much as you think you can. Yes, Because, um, you know, you don't want to be putting yourself in a bad situation where you're over your limit. And if something goes wrong, then who knows what happens. So. Totally. Totally. And, and there's always the risk of your insurance company noticing this and voiding your policy because you've yes. driven out of the cars. If you, come to, if you come to grief. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. yes. So just keep in totally. mind. Um, but yeah, I, I discuss all of that and more in my written and video reviews coming soon. Very good. Yeah. Very Can good. I just add a bit of context on that payload? The yep. Back to the 300 series. The base GX has a payload of 785 kilos. And this is a, uh, you know, a, a wagon, not mm -hmm. a ute. Yeah. So, you know, not yes. with a giant tray out the back. Yeah. Yes. Uh, and, yes. and something that also has coil springs in the rear. And, you know, a lot of uh, fleet customers, uh, you know, like I used to work for Snowy Hydro in the Snowy Mountains scheme. And the uh, we used to have uh, land cruisers that they would take the back seats out of and put a platform in the back and put a cargo cage in the back. And you'd have a two seat vehicle that they use that payload. And, you yeah. know, it's enclosed, it's safer than having a ute. If, you know, if you were to roll the vehicle, then, you know, stuff isn't necessarily going to impact the environment as much. Um, so, yeah, all these things that are worth considering if you are seriously going to buy a ute like that for um, serious work. And in my review, you know, I don't want to give away too much, but I've basically said if you are thinking about a, a a ute like this, a Raptor X as a tradie vehicle, then maybe you should be saving yourself some money Think hard and getting yourself a wild track or an XLT. You were a um, water taste tester, weren't you, for Snowy Hydro? That was oh, part, of, how, part of your role, wasn't it? Man? How did you find that out? I, <laughs> I just know these things. Now, um, I can finish things off with um, story went up overnight. It's on the site now. Um, Lexus ES, um, an updated version of the current one. And it's the ES has been a bit of a wallflower for Lexus historically. You know, it's this shrinking violet, fairly conservative, and it blossomed into a, a full-blown design showpiece, you know, in its, I think, its current seventh uh, generation. 
So there are various models, in fact, eight variations from 61 or nearly 62 up to just over $78,000. Um, and there are now two versions. There's an ES250 and an ES300H. They both use the same, fundamentally the same engine. One is just uh, a naturally aspirated four cylinder, two and a half litre. The other is the hybrid that we're already familiar with. Um, it's just that the petrol engine uses a different combustion cycle, the, the Atkinson cycle. Um, and it's a perfect partner then for an electric motor to make up for some of its low down uh, power shortcomings. So the naturally aspirated car is an eight-speed auto, the hybrid is a CVT, and they're both front-wheel drive. So you're talking about 150-odd kilowatts to 160 kilowatts for the, um, the hybrid. And it's grown. It shows how much cars in this category have crept up over successive generations. It's about five metres long. <laughs> so it's, it's not insubstantial. It's 1.7 tonnes. And really the changes are relatively modest. Um, the, the upper models, the F Sport and Sport Luxury models get these, what they're calling tri-beam LEDs. And they do give the, the car a fairly menacing look and obviously upgrade its, its lighting capability. And there've been some tweaks to the grill on some other models, but um, one of the bigger changes was a, a big multimedia screen, which allows you to sidestep the remote touch um, function, which is, Lexus's own um, means of, of interacting with the multimedia system, which I, I couldn't think of a worse one in the world. Um, it's still there, but at least this screen is now a touch screen and just allows you to do what you want to do. Yeah. Um, and on the plus side, it is impossibly quiet. This car is like an EV. It's the engine and exhaust. I said it sounds like a distant beehive, you know, just this little hum. Um, and there's even active noise cancellation through the audio system. Um, it offers, in my view, really good value in that part of the market. You, you're talking cars like a C-Class and, and others. Um, safety, refinement, it's incredibly refined, very good suspension, and it's roomy because it's, it's crept up in size. Mm -hmm. The minus is um, it's relatively modest on the steering feel and not exactly a, a, a great, it points nicely, but not a good connection really with the front tires and your hands on the wheel. There's no folding rear seat. So from a practicality point of view, it's really compromised. There's a ski hmm. port. Regardless of drivetrain? I think regardless of drivetrain, I'll have to, I'd have to double check that, but yeah. that's a, that's a compromise. And the warranty they're at four years, hundred thousand kilometers, which is, off the pace now set by Genesis and Merck and Jaguar. And uh, I think they need to lift their game there, which is so ironic because Lexus from day dot has been all about the ownership and after sales experience. Mm. And I think that that warranty is, um, is lagging behind where the rest of the field is, particularly uh, Merck. I've asked their boss, is Scott Thompson still, um, I think, yep. and uh, Lexus Australia and, um, yeah, I've asked them a few times, why still four years and 100,000 kilometres? And he said, well, people hang on to their Lexus as longer than that anyway. So, yeah. you know, yeah. like, you know, with um, more of the European rivals, they tend to turn their cars over within a lease period of two years, three years, typically. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I think um, Lexus being of that Toyota uh, mindset you know the reliability factor is maybe uh theoretically a bit better than yeah. a, a european rival it's it yeah. sounds a lot like how toyota hung on to three years for a very long a long time, time. because yes. the the buyers weren't asking for more because they yeah. trusted them mm -hmm. that's it it's it's the whole nature of a warranty isn't it is mm. is a long warranty shoring up a dodgy reputation or is a mm. long warranty a factor and a product of a very reliable uh, car Mm -hmm. You know, um, which, which way do you look at it? And we know Kia will go to 10 years as soon as people are asking for it, but it will cost more. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, yes. All so right. it's a balance. There's my thoughts uh, on the ES for what it's worth, but um, incredibly comfy and uh, just pin drop quiet in uh, extraordinary in that regard. All right. Now, last week we had uh, the main topic of has Mazda gone mad, which is a fairly broad question, but it was really about <laughs> Um, SUVs and the proliferation of SUVs current and upcoming. And we had some interesting uh, feedback on that. Bill Catapotis, regular correspondent, he's perplexed by Mazda's new model intentions, but not so much by the number and complexity. 
more that car companies are jumping over themselves to showcase hybrid and uh, electric and hydrogen, while Mazda tries to be BMW and Audi on the ICE direction, you know, that they're still making platforms that are uh, suitable for internal combustion engines. And he thinks they've, they've lost the plot. Do either of you guys think that's uh, a point worth making in regard to Mazda's SUV intentions? I think that definitely the um, vast majority of manufacturers are investing more heavily into electrified architectures mm. uh, as their future proofing, um, you know, their future brand uh, and, and the position that those brands will need to take. Yeah. But Mazda does have a slightly different um, buyer, I think, and a slightly different reputation, I think, um, particularly in its home nation of Japan. Yep. Uh, and I think that also the home nation of Japan isn't quite as drawn to electric um, quite as much as some other places in That's the world where it's mandated. Point. That's so, an interesting point. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Which is surprising given the population density of Japan. And the fact that they're such a technological leader in so yeah. many other ways, yeah. that they are seemingly uh, broadly quite slow to adapt to this new technology. True. Yeah. True. So Mazda's, you know, long made it clear that they plan to go electric and have this spectrum of introduction of electric. And I remember I was at the, uh, they had a big thing, uh, I think it was 2016 for the, the announcement of Sky Active X, which was the compression ignition, yep. you know, et cetera, et cetera. And they, they sort of laid out their, their timeline uh, for us. And, you know, there was the plug-in hybrid, full electric, you know, along the way. Now, they may seem to be not as uh, ready to introduce it across the lineup as other manufacturers, but maybe they're just focusing on selling the cars that people want to buy right now. I know, but it's you know, a planning game, isn't it? It's, it's, it's a whole strategic definitely. planning thing. It's, it's definitely, tricky. you know, they're going to have to catch up soon as, as you know, all these markets go EV only yes. or electrified only. Um, yeah, if they want to play in those markets, it's going to be a much more complicated playing field. Yeah, particularly yeah. when, you know, they're expanding their SUV lineup, uh, yep. left, front and centre. You're going to need something yep. more than, you know, the, the, the uh, MX-30 uh, capable drivetrain for Too true. CX-9, aren't you? Mm. <laughs> well, beyond. it's interesting. Bertie, Bertie painted an elaborate uh, picture for us and said, Mazda's like the hot person you meet at the blue light disco in your teens on Saturday night in country Victoria circa 1982. Um, that is until you spend time chatting during the following week and uncover some personality flaws. I look at every Mazda model with great anticipation only to uncover a show-stopping flaw usually a lack of oomph, or in the case of the Mazda 3 hatch, woeful rear seat room. And he actually poses the question, do the youngsters still have blue light discos? And it's such ancient history for me. I remember Kangaroo Street in Manly was an absolute red hot spot for, uh, for blue light discos, but maybe Lofty Jr. is coming of age and can tell us whether or not the blue light discos. Uh, Say, so I've never been to one, James. No, yeah, I've, neither. I've, I've never uh, had the option what? of going to one. <laughs> we had school yeah. socials, but not... Not a, not a you disco. haven't lived till you've been to a blue light disco. Uh, well, let's bring them back. The, the cars the blue, blue the light blue, disco coming to a pub near you. The blue light inferring that it was police It'll sanctioned. Purple light. Yeah. That it was okay with the, you know, the constabulary. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, now Marco Viss, he says, I think Mazda's madness is less than it appears. They're either pa paired with hatches or sedans or replacing existing models over time. And he actually gave us a, a masterclass in uh, product planning demonstration. Uh, won't go into the detail. But he said that CX-90 will potentially replace CX-9. And I wish there was a Mazda 9 um, sedan. And I'm sure he's not alone there. It'd be quite the car. A replacement for 929 would be uh, <laughs> welcome, I would have thought. They did then, stop making a 929 for a reason, though. Yeah, true. <laughs> True, but times have moved on. Times have moved on. You never know. Um, Not the direction says, of large sedans, though. <laughs> his personal his personal theory on Mazda's success in Australia, because we touched on that as well. That you're often quizzed by people in other countries. Why is Mazda so successful in Australia? It says that people got to know the brand pretty well throughout the eighties and nineties when everyone knew the Ford Laser was really a Mazda. Uh, they built on their good reputation from there. Do you guys think that the Mazda three two three combination? did good things for Mazda or was Ford the main beneficiary out of that? Now you've probably got a bit more opinion on this, but I, I think Mazda, not necessarily that 
um, it was a shared product and that people knew it. I think they just had an interesting marketing technique and good pricing, you know? Yeah, and Mazda sold very few 323s compared to Ford's Laser. And I think people yeah. just accepted that there was a good small Ford option. And yes. you now those in the new knew that it was a Mazda under the skin, but I think people just were happy to accept something with a blue oval that was good. Mm. Yeah. Uh, okay. <laughs> That's good. That's Which good. wasn't always the case. Now, we, we had a lot of commentary too where people were saying all Mazdas look the same. So we're getting into Audi syndrome uh, territory. Robert Hocking, uh, Reventon Rowe, uh, Jay Fomo. You know, they make a great getaway car. Nobody would be able to tell the cops which Mazda they saw, um, which is, <laughs> is an interesting comment. And uh, Charlie Wally says the SUV segment, he, he spells S-U-V, S-O-O-V, the SUV segment is boring as f- um, And Mazda uh, is making sure that we get the message. So he's not exactly thrilled uh, by SUVs in general. And, yeah, but that's what people are buying, mate. You know, I know. Doesn't, I know. doesn't matter whether you like them. It's just that 99% of the world likes them. Yes, yes. Now, we had some general commentary, which we'll, we'll uh, rattle through reasonably rapidly. De Cook, our old mate, great show, guys. Thanks and welcome, Tim. We had Tim Nicholson with us last week for the first time. He agrees that e-swaps are pure blasphemy. Uh, oh, no wonder out. has it got binned if he started off like that. That was the E-Type Zero that he and his, his new bride drove away in. Matt, I think you beg to differ. Is that would that yeah, be? Yeah, get out. We saw. I love e swaps. I love oh. an e swap. I um, some of you know that I have an Audi TT, uh, and I would love for it to be an electric car, but instead I'm going to sell it. So that's all the <laughs> dramas you've been having with the engine. You're just there swearing <laughs> late at night. No, I wish I could get rid of this thing. The engine's oh, okay. tip top, JC. Okay. All tip right, top. No worries. It's what about you, Matt? Where do you door. stand? Like a classic car. Oh, it depends on the car. Like if the car is a classic because of its engineering and drivetrain and you know mechanical sympathy, uh, sim- sympathy, symphony and all that business, then yeah, maybe not. But if it's a car that looks beautiful, you know, say a Citroen DS, no one has yeah. ever celebrated the drivetrain of a Citroen DS. It's all about okay. the styling, suspension, uh, you know, the 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 overall experience. I reckon a, a, an electrified DS would be outstanding. And, Interesting. You know, I'd rather that than trying to fix an old Citroen four-cylinder that is mm. pretty slow to start with and not the car, not the engine the car was intended to have either. Yes. Now, thank you, Mel. Um, I, I'm, I don't think I'm on board with you just yet, but anyway, fair point. Um, planes, trains, and dogs and cars poses a question. Surely the future in dash design is a one-piece long panel that houses all the relevant information, like Ionic, um, Mercedes-Benz, EV6. So why are manufacturers persisting with two digital screens, one with no sun glare protection, the other still in a deep cowling protected from supposed glare? Um, It's a fair point. I I love the Mercedes dual screen setup. It just suits my taste. I love it uh, to death. And I remember the concept version of the Honda E had just, and I think we've got an image up for those on YouTube, just wall to wall screen. You know, it was the whole dash was just one long screen. And to me, that's beautiful and makes so much sense. Do you think it's just hanging on to a tradition that causes vehicle designers and engineers to stick to to separate kind of screens for different functions? What do you think? I think it's costs. Do you think it's costs? Yeah. Yeah, um, It's much cheaper to buy you know, 50,000 12.3 inch TFT screens than it is to buy 25,000 32 inch screens. Yeah. And if the 32 inch screen breaks, then you've got to replace the big screen. Uh, Whereas if the 12.3 inch one breaks, then it's much easier to replace. Also, I think the compartmentalizing of information versus uh, infotainment is Mm. the the crucial factor there. Mm. We will get to a point, you know, we've seen concept cars, like you say, uh, and and production cars with big screens. There was a, um, I can't, Byton, I think it was the Chinese brand that had a 48 inch screen that ran across the dashboard and it was about, you know, 14 inches tall. Um, It was huge. Um, And, you know, you had to look over a screen to look at the road. Um, And in a lot of cars now you do have to do that, but I think that there's definitely screen overload um, Mm. and Mm. uh, you know, driving a couple of cars recently, I've recently had some time in the Havel Jolien. Uh, It's got two high definition, really interesting looking screens, but geez, bloody interacting with them is difficult like it's a point you know going through menus when you're driving is maybe you're not supposed to be doing that but um a button or a switch is always going to be a better option in my bring bring back the knob 
bring back the knob. <laughs> That's what I'd say. And I mean, I don't, I don't know which which designer it was that that said it initially, but lights and screens are the new chrome. So mm. they've become a decoration as much as they are a functional kind of part of the car. So that's where the compromise comes in, I think. The cost mm. thing is really interesting. I reckon screens are potentially quite cheap relative to yeah. mechanical instruments. Yeah, um, particularly so if right. you can buy them in standard sizes, which that's right. back to that, you know, dash And you charge a premium because units. they look amazing. Like, look yeah. at these screens, but they don't cost much. No, mm. and you know, and you can tell that when you are driving more affordable uh, mm. vehicles with those big screens, you can tell the shortcuts that have been taken because they want to put everything through those screens because it costs less yeah. to do that. Yeah, and it's, it's much cheaper to engineer <laughs> software once than it is to buy billions of buttons and knobs. Yes. So, yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, we'll, we'll move on. And lastly, Steve Isles came at us uh, via email. Thank you, Steve. He loves the podcast, but he thinks we're getting a bit long and a fair bit of waffle in the middle. We've just been waffling then. So uh, Steve's probably just there gnashing his teeth. Uh, and he says, can you give some attention to those who do not talk to the microphone? And I think what we would say there, Steve, is that the balancing act between the watching the clock and letting the conversation wander a bit, you know, potentially down an interesting path is what we're, we're trying to do. So maybe we succeed. I think we succeed uh, more than we fail, but, but occasionally we, we maybe uh, we don't. And yes, the sound has been a challenge while we've been in, in lockdown. Um, we're doing our best um, to make it as good as we can. Um, we'll have um, some news on that when we're able to, to go back into our studio and, and what have you. But um, you can probably see the microphones we're talking into now. We we try and do it as well as we can, but appreciate the feedback and thank you. Thank you for letting us know. Is that a microphone um, pun there with feedback? Uh, what do you mean feedback? Huh? <laughs> yes. Um, okay. And look, with that, we have reached the finish line. So I want to say thank you, Matt. Thank you. And thank you, Mel. You're welcome, James. And thanks to our production engineer, Mr. Brett Sullivan for keeping all the technical I's dotted and the editing T's crossed. Um, he's jumped into the Halloween spirit early, dressed today as Dobby the Elf from Harry Potter. Um, incredible look. And jump into the conversation, Cars Guides on Facebook and Instagram, or email us at comments at carsguide.com.au. Apple podcast listeners, please take a moment to rate and review the show. Five is the preferred number of stars. But if, like Steve, you think we're a bit waffly, let us know there as well. Thank you. Um, if you enjoyed the episode, make sure to subscribe to the Cars Guide YouTube channel so you can stay on top of all our latest content. But before we go, I was driving home fairly late this week and sure enough, came up to some night road works. Uh, strangely, rather than a pair of lollipop people, there was simply a sign saying, lane, lane closed, move to other side. It <laughs> just made me cross. <laughs> oh dear <laughs> thanks james i thought it was a good one <laughs> mel has nothing